Hey, thanks for tuning in this week. Uh, this episode of the Art, Music, and Technology podcast is again being brought to you by our friends over at Splice.com. If you want to help out the website, you can go over to Splice.com using our special link, which is Splice.com slash Art Music Tech Dash Music. That's Art Music Tech Dash Music. And if you want to try out their sample library, you can get a free month's uh, test drive using our code MUSICARTTECH. All uh, three words smashed together. Uh, help us out, but also check out the kind of cool collaboration tools that you get working with Splice. I use it every single week uh, for doing interactions with friends out in California. It really works out great. I think that you'll like it too. Get collaborating. Now with that, uh, please enjoy this discussion with the Audio Kit crew. Okay, today I have a couple of very special guests. This is going to be one of my rare duo combo interviews, but I'm really excited. I One of the guests reached out to me, brought in the other person, and we started talking about things. And I have a feeling that this is going to be one of those discussions where I'm going to only be able to ask about 10% of where I want to go, but we'll get kicked off and then we'll make sure that we schedule something coming up soon as a follow-up. But all that mystery just gives me an opportunity to introduce you to two people. First of all, we have Matthew Fetcher, and secondly, we have Ari Prohaska. These two folks are involved in one of the more exciting projects that I've run across recently. It's called Audio Kit. It's a development toolkit that you use to make audio programs and audio content, but it is one of those things that it it reveals itself in a very open and uh, kind of relaxed fashion. Where I started hearing about it is people I know who had like wacky dreams of audio stuff saying, you know what, I think I'm just going to learn audio kit and try and make this thing I've always dreamed about doing. It's uh, whenever I hear that, that always like pricks up my ears because I'm like, oh, that means that something has sort of like pierced the veil of culture a little bit, or at least art tech culture. Uh, and this certainly has. So with that, I'm going to say hello to Matthew and Ari. Hey guys, how's it going? Hey Darwin, so great to be here. This is Matthew, by the way, for the listeners. Ah, yes, uh, right. We, I, I already violated my rule, which I was going to talk to one person at a time. So, thank you, Matthew, for doing that. Hey, Ari, how are you? I'm good. Pleasure right. to be here. Yeah, well, it's great to have you both involved in this discussion, and I'm glad to have you both because uh, the discussions about these things are gonna are gonna uh, veer a little bit all over the place. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off with you, Matthew, and ask you to talk a little, tell us a little bit about who you are and uh, what part of the project you're involved in. Hey everyone, my name is Matthew Fetcher. I've been a core team member of AudioKit for about three and a half, four years now. Uh, currently, I'm the lead on making sort of our end user facing products like AudioKit Synth One, FM Player. I maintain the website and help with that. And the iOS community and developer community is such a special place right now. It kind of reminds me of the shareware community of the late 90s, early 2000s, where everyone interacts with each other. Most of the developers know each other. And the users interact with the developers. And we all kind of feed off each other to create something special. Yeah, I don't know if I answered any of your questions. <laughs> no, that's, that's really great. Uh, it's kind of interesting to think of uh, the iOS community being like that, but it's my experience has been very similar. Whenever I go to sort of like meetups that are oriented towards iOS development, there's a level of sharing that just doesn't happen in a lot of other communities. So that's that's a really uh, important point to make. Great. Um, Ari, why don't we have you uh, talk a little bit about yourself and your part of the project? All right. Um, my name is Ari Prohaska, and I'm the founder of AudioKit. I started it about five or six years ago now. It started off closed source, but we made an open source project. And uh, through building audio apps for ourselves, we uh, realized the toolkit is gonna, something we really want to put in the hands of people and made it open source. And uh, since then, it's just been growing by leaps and bounds. 
I don't know what else what else about my background I should talk about, but that's the the history of like uh, that's when I started Audio Kit and uh, where I'm where I see it going. I don't know. I think it's really interesting to explore this idea of the project, meaning Audio Kit, being more interesting than the product. What are what were some of the products that you had originally started working on? <laughs> um, so yeah, that's kind of embarrassing. I, I had a basically a set of ear training apps that I had been working on for many years and uh, it was called guitar games. And basically it came out of the situation where I was, I would always like my kind of my, my backstory is that I was always a musician all my life, but I, I never was all that great. I would always do things like buy guitars and have lots of cool equipment, but I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't like a great player, and one day I actually was uh, I was fired from a company that I got. I started on my own. I was one of the founders, and the, all the founders got fired. And I decided I'm going to just take music seriously for a change. And I put an ad on the Recycler. I got into a really great band. Uh, I think because they saw the equipment that I had, maybe they <laughs> thought I I would build their website for them or something. They we we got on really well, but I was really tortured because I never felt I was good enough to be in this band. So I uh, started really focusing on improving my musical skills and I've got ear training CDs where they would, you know, play for you intervals and chords and have you identify them. And I'm such a left brain person that I could actually memorize what the order of the chords that in on the CDs were, or the the intervals, faster than I could hear them, oh, <laughs> and okay. uh, so I fixed myself by writing ear training programs, like getting my computer to give me random intervals to identify and things like that, and that's where it all kind of started. Where I started to think about uh, using music with computers and and combining those two, and so. The toolkit that kind of supported my ear training endeavors was what eventually kind of morphed into audio kit. Now, let me ask you a little bit. So if, if I understand it right, um, audio kit is really a tool for uh, Swift programmers to develop audio programming. You, you really focused on Swift as the programming language of choice in this case. Why did you make that decision? Um, well, so first off, AudioKit was originally an Objective C project, oh, okay. and and uh, this was before Swift came out. Was a, the original name for AudioKit was Objective C Sound, because <laughs> we were we were using C Sound as our engine, uh, ah. which I'm sure you're familiar with, and we yes. had put an Objective C layer on top of that. So we thought we were clever, and we called Objective C Sound. It's very clever. Um, <laughs> But it was also extremely like limiting. So we were, we were always like at the mercy of C Sound and all the weirdness about their language and stuff like that. So around about the same time when Swift came out, we were looking to make a change, and so we lost C Sound as the engine, and we adopted a, a few other engines like uh, Synthesis Toolkit and Soundpipe, and. We we really love the Swift language. It's it's really it's a lot more enjoyable to work with than Objective C. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a lot more familiar to modern programs, the style and the syntax, and and all kids, all the cool kids were using it. So <laughs> it, it made a lot of sense. Uh, Swift also came together with Swift Playgrounds, which was pretty attractive to me because it was a way to quickly get up and running. So you can run Swift Playgrounds and Audio Kit to get little experimentations in music done quickly without having to compile a project, getting work on your device, that sort of thing. It's just a small, uh, one single file in which you can do quick sketches of audio, DSP connections and things like that. So, uh, yeah, basically the reason why we use Swift is because it's uh, it was the big thing to use for uh, for Apple stuff. We like the syntax, and Playgrounds made it fun to learn uh, to use Swift and to play with audio inside that environment. Sure. Now, Matthew, you said that you, uh, you really focus a lot on the end user-facing stuff, and when we originally started talking, it was in relationship to the Synth 1 iOS device, right? 
Yes, sir. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about how you, first of all, got started working with the Audio Kit Project, but then w- how you decided to take on development of what is a high-end device and a high-end application on for the iPad, how you decided that that was uh, what you were, how you were going to express yourself. Well, it's, it's very kind of you to say anything uh, that we build with AudioKit is high-end. I don't know if we'd agree with you. As far as getting involved with AudioKit, uh, I started when it was still in an Objective-C, and uh, I was just thrilled with the idea of you know making music apps. I was already an iOS developer, but audio programming was incredibly difficult, and so much of it was undocumented. And here, Ari and a few other people had made this library that you know you could insert a few lines of code and have a working basic oscillator or a basic filter and it was just mind-blowing that hey i could actually build something cool so i got involved by when swift came out that week i think i converted all their objective c examples to swift and i think at that point Ari's like hey you've you've written ten thousand lines of code for audio kit i'm going to make you a team member <laughs> 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 That's the barrier. Instead of the 10,000 hours, it's the 10,000 lines of code. That's great. <laughs> yes. Not so, uh, programming, yeah. Yeah, so let me ask you, I mean, I'm going to come back to the Swift question a lot because I think there's a lot of people who, first of all, because it's Apple-focused, and second of all, because it's relatively new, are going to have some skepticism about that. For you, since you were already with de- used to dealing with the hieroglyphics of Objective-C, what was it that made made Swift seem uh, so attractive to you? It, it just seemed like a higher level programming language. It was just easier for me to, to wrap my head around uh, just because Objective C is a little very Apple centric, you know, compared to like C sharp or C plus plus. It's fair. Uh, I, have you done any Objective C programming? Yeah, uh, yeah, I did. <laughs> I, like the the day after they released the first iOS dev kit. I made my first uh, OSC networked interaction with Max, and it was great fun. But at the same time, it is like, I use the phrase hieroglyphics on purpose, where there's almost like excessive use of punctuation tooling to sort of like construct statements and stuff. And Absolutely. so, very verbose. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and and for me, it doesn't flow from my fingers as I'm typing, so all of a sudden, it feels like a number of speed bumps between me and getting the program written, you know? Absolutely, and when Swift came out, it sort of opened the door to all levels of programmers. If someone knew JavaScript, there's probably a good chance they can pick up Swift and and Uh build an app with it. Sure. And that lowers the bar for audio programming in general. It's just amazing to see people who are not only making their first audio app, but their first app in general using Swift and AudioKit. It's it's pretty pretty exciting. I think we just blogged about a 14-year-old kid who made a synth app, and um, that kid's going to be a, a lot smarter than us. <laughs> <laughs> Got a head start. <laughs> <laughs> right, indeed. Ari, I want to talk a little bit about your background, because as the developer, as one of the initiators of this uh, project, uh, I'm really curious because audio programming for for the longest amount of time was sort of like uh, secret incantations, right? There wasn't there wasn't a book you could buy that say that says you know here's the 52 things you need to know about writing DSP programs. Instead, you had to sort of like pick things from this website and and be signed up to this other mailing list and then if you went to school you would know this guy and if you talked to him you would crack things open right how did you get uh to the point where you were an experienced audio programmer what was the track that you took that got you there well i don't necessarily feel like an audio a de- experienced audio developer and i'll tell you why so the, when i mentioned the ear training apps i was working on I actually, the first thing that I started to code with, uh, code audio with, was a Max. And I attended a conference on learning Max, and I, and I really enjoyed that process. So I actually started off in something you're f- very familiar with, like mm-hmm. kind of not knowing how to program audio, looking there online to see what, what can make it easier and, and finding these tools. And what happened was uh, I... 
it didn't gel with me. I, I didn't, I'm not a graphical kind of thinker. I'm not a graphical programmer by any means. And I, I really, I really like programming in, in text. So that's why I started to look elsewhere. And then I, you know, I found C sound and that, Again, that was an interface that it said, okay, we know audio programs really hard, so we're going to give you this other kind of language to write on top of it, that'll, then we'll, we'll take care of the DSP for you if you can write this language. But even that language seemed like this is really <laughs> difficult to understand. And it's, <laughs> talk about hieroglyphics, it's right. really a, a nightmare. So I said, I got I got to wrap this stuff in something I can understand. <laughs> so Objective C, for all of its warts, um, if you if you just say okay, I'm going to just grin and bear it and use the IDE, mm -hmm. uh, Xcode did like autocomplete for you, and it did it was very verbose. So I took the notation of C sound, which was like all the shortenings and very very terse letters like OSC and hz for frequency and i just made everything very long so oh. when you start you wrote an audio kit originally it was like bracket yeah because it's objective c and then ak oscillator and then frequency colon and you put the frequency <laughs> amplitude colon and you could put it all on separate lines and comment the heck out of it and right. it it sort of to me it read much more like english and that's the kind of programmer i am i i i don't enjoy being like the nitty gritty i can make this super efficient by diving down into machine language to do it right i want to write a overall sketch that other people can read that i can read in the future that still makes sense so you know swift when swift came along i was able to keep most of that verbosity without a lot of the extra junk so that still works i mean audio kit still has longer names than you'll find in any other language sure but as far as like you know, learning, I, I used audio as, as an excuse to, or building this wrapper to learn more about DSP. So okay, we threw a C sound I mentioned mm -hmm. um, in, in change of sound pipe. And I worked with Paul Bassler, the inventor of sound pipe to, to do more of that lower level. So then I go from being a top level guy to a little bit deeper because mm -hmm. I feel like I can do a little bit of DSP now. I can understand it and that's that's kind of the slippery slope that i am hoping <laughs> that audio kit you know people begin to turn on to audio kit will allow them to go down it's like okay if i had to start off with like writing ones and zeros to make a, a wave table and then oscillating through it that might be something i don't understand but if i can start with you know i want to make a filter so i write ak resonant filter or whatever it is and i i write the parameters and i hear some sound very quickly then I'm intrigued, and I and I write more code, and then I say, well, maybe, maybe I want to write my own filter, and I and then you at least have been you have experience with it, and you can say, okay, I'm ready to take the next step to go a little bit deeper. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. Well, also the the interesting thing, I've always been kind of a fan of things that had very descriptive function and constant naming and stuff because then I felt like the program told its own story instead of me having to constantly add it via comments or whatever. So it's a, that's a, a really interesting perspective and uh, yet another thing that, uh, that makes me like really, <laughs> really uh, interested in diving in. I'm, I have to admit that while I, I spent a fair amount of time doing some Objective-C, I've not really spent any time at Swift at all. So this is making me kind of interested in doing so. Now let me ask you though before we before we dive in, let's go a little further back now in time and talk about you. You are one of these people. You both are uh, are these people that really have your hands in both musical and artistic exploration as well as technical exploration. And I always find it really interesting to find out about the backgrounds of the people that carry both buckets of water, right? It's not something that necessarily works out as as a as an easy path, and so I'm kind of curious. Are did you start off focused on music and come to the technical? Did you start off as a technical person and come to love music? What what Ari was the was the thing that drew you into the combination? Man, uh, I think it it kind of would always 
go back and forth throughout the course of my life. For instance, when I was a kid, I really liked science fiction. So I started off being sort of tech, technical, nerdy. And then I think it was Kiss, the, the rock band Kiss, had a, <laughs> had a guitarist who dressed up as a spaceman. So that brought my attention to music kind of through being interested in, in space. And so I, I ended up liking Kiss and, and get, picking up guitar for the first time. And then I went away from that. I did aeronautical engineering, uh, got a PhD in aeronautical engineering from Caltech and got involved in internet. And so I was, again, I was away from music. And then, like I said, it was having that all go away unexpectedly where I said, no, no, now I want to go back and take, go into music. And when I found that I, I needed to improve with music, the way I obviously went to go improve with music was through adding computers to the equation. Right. And, and so, yeah, it's been this constant back and forth where I find that my technical background is, has helped me musically, but I definitely would think I'm a technical person first and musical person second. I'm an average player, and I, I, I attempt to get make myself better through technology and try to make my like shows that I do interesting through technology. But it wasn't like I had a musical story I needed to tell and that I needed to figure out computers to do that. No, it was more like I was really good at computers and and try and augment my my musicianship. I see. Well, I will tell you now, I am I am happy to announce that in this episode, which is going to be episode number 246, I have finally found a person who has like one of the key tools of like connectedness with me, which is a a fascination with Ace Freely of the band Kiss. I have, <laughs> up to this point, <laughs> nobody else has been willing to pull the trigger on that, and I'm glad to hear it, because because that band and, and like, just the visuals of that somehow was comforting me into saying that my interests don't collide. My interest in music and an interest in science fiction and science and tech and stuff didn't have to be polar opposites, and so I appreciate you saying that, because... <laughs> Uh, that really resonates for me. That's really funny. You know, I used to run acefreely.com. <laughs> oh, did you really? No. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I absolutely did. I, I am looking at one of my uh, Les Paul's uh, sunbursts that I, I got because of my obsession with Ace. And, uh, yeah, I, I got to meet him several times. Oh, and really? And it was a, a complete and utter letdown. Oh, no. Um yeah, I I, th- I hope he's cleaned himself up since since then because I haven't. It's been at least a decade since I've seen him, but uh-huh. he was so wasted. Uh-huh. And you know, you go, you meet your your heroes, and he, and he's just like completely not there. And oh, that's too bad. It's like, yeah, but I know that he's into computers and stuff, so maybe someday he'll uh, will our paths will cross again. Right, that's cool. Uh, Matthew, tell me a little bit about your background and how you got to the mix of music and tech. Well, first of all, I can't follow Ari's story. I mean, <laughs> it's got a, a website tribute to the lead guitar player of Kiss. That's amazing. Nothing that interesting. So, you know, I grew up in central Indiana, a farming community. And, uh, you know, growing up in the 80s, you know, you heard synthesizer music on the radio. But, you know, as a kid, you didn't know how to make it. Or, you know, I certainly couldn't afford $3,000 synthesizers or anything like that. You know, my dad worked in a factory and my mom didn't work. So eventually in high school, uh, Nirvana came out and this was like some music that we could actually play. So, you know, we played in garage bands. I bought, you know, a $200 bass and, and rocked out and I was able to sound like what was on the radio. But I still had, you know, a love of synthesizers. You know, through the years, I did collect little Yamaha and Casio keyboards and, you know, tried to emulate that. Then, you know, in college, I actually majored in computer science at Purdue. And I didn't think, you know, I'd be smart enough to ever make any kind of music software. I mean, that was kind of a pipe dream, but I didn't think it would ever happen just because it seemed like such a pie in the sky concept, you know, because no one in central Indiana was making music software in, you know, the early 90s. It's just, I just didn't even know where to start. I think that was before VSTs were even popular. So I ended up graduating and playing in bands. And kind of put the whole idea of music tech away until maybe 20 years later when I discovered what Ari was doing and and realized, hey, this this may actually be 
possible. So I, I think, you know, Ari deserves a lot of credit for bringing a lot of people into audio programming that may not have done it on any other platforms. Sure. You you may think that, well, again, you said that you listen to my podcast for a month, so you know that I too come from Midwestern farming country. Yes, sir. There is a thing that happens for those of us who know more about cow manure than, uh, <laughs> you know, than uh, rock clubs, which is that you end up with this real inferiority complex. You feel, and you even mentioned it right there, which is like you thought it would be a pipe dream that you could ever do the thing that you wanted to do. Because something about growing up in farm country makes you think, well, I, I should only focus on practical things because the other stuff is just not real. How did you get over that? You know, I think it was just seeing other people succeed and having a safety net of someone to look to as like a mentor to, to have someone to ask questions. Uh, because with so much undocumented, I, I mean, I tried to get involved in some other open source projects and, and some of them weren't as helpful to new people. They were a little more established for making music and they could have been a little short and condescending. Whereas I think audio kit, they say that open source projects are a reflection of the founder and Ari's a very open and generous guy. And he, he does it day in and day out for the love of music and exploring and discovering all these things. And so I think that kind of reflects on the culture of the people who, who join AudioKit and everyone's willing to commit code, whether or not they feel adequate, and he will walk you through it and help you. And, you know, uh, my code even today isn't spectacular, but um, he helps me improve it. So I think just having someone there to guide you makes a huge difference. And I think that's part of the reason why AudioKit has, has taken off. Yeah, well, it's interesting, and in, in Ari, I, I find it, I found it really surprising that on the GitHub uh, readme that you kind of list yourself as being the lifeline. If people have questions, reach out directly to you. And I think that once a once projects get to a certain level of popularity, a lot of times that becomes overwhelming to the to kind of the founders, and they start trying to fold into the background, it seems like you, like you are very comfortable being in that kind of support and that super supportive role. Is that something that comes natural to you? It doesn't seem to come natural to a lot of technical people. Uh, I mean, I definitely get off on people using audio kit and I want them to use it. So anytime somebody has something interesting that they're trying to accomplish with audio kit i almost feel like it's my duty to make sure that they don't get hung up for too long because what i'm waiting for what i'm really excited about is people using audio kit in like new and exciting ways that to create things i couldn't have imagined myself and, and but still be able to take some credit for um, and be happy that these exist only because they were empowered by audio kit so it, to me, it never makes any sense to cut yourself off from those kinds of people because you don't, you never know which uh, potential contributor is going to be huge. I know there were people who who contributed something, and I the devil sitting on my shoulder might have said like, "Oh, this is terrible, rip them in shreds." <laughs> <laughs> But I'll I'll say oh, no no don't do that you know say something nice and let's let's fix this and then they turn out to be like a really important core contributor after a, after a while so it's a safer way to be is the way I approach it. Now one of the one of the other things I'd say though is that you, you talked earlier about how you're not necessarily hyper focused on optimization and tweaking the last bit out. It seems like your focus is more on making the broadest possible number of things uh, accessible and easy to experiment with. And you also talked a little bit about the Swift playgrounds and, and not being familiar with Swift. I could use a little primer on what that means and then what you do to sort of like set the plate for people that want to experiment with that. Sure. So uh, you're right that audio gets kind of a broad stroke over a lot of things audio. First of all, it's a it can do synthesis, it can do processing, and it can also do analysis of sound, like detection of frequencies and things like that. And that's 
it's very hard for any one person to be an expert at all of those fields. Even within synthesis, there's a lot of different kinds of things that are hard to be experts uh, on. So I rely on team and uh, libraries to to do some of the heavy lifting, and I'll and I will make it easier to put those things together in interesting ways. So uh, with a playground, for instance, you can you can open up a file write import audio kit, say let osc or oscillator equal ak oscillator parenthesis parenthesis um, audio kit dot start oscillator dot start and then your playground will be making sound. It'll be making a default sound of 440 hertz at full amplitude, so you might be careful with your headphones <laughs> on or something. Um, but then, then you can edit that. You can say then you can put a line above that say oscillator dot frequency equals and and change the, the thing. And then you can say instead of saying oh there's one line I forgot there's like audio kit output equals oscillator. So okay. uh, if you change that, if you add, say like let reverb equal to um, AK reverb affecting the oscillator, and then say the audio output is the is the reverb now you hear a reverberated oscillator so within seconds after your last key press the xcode is recompiling the code that you just wrote and setting output to the speaker so what you can what that allows you to do is be surprised by what your code is like if anyone's trying to write a bunch of audio kit code and has in their mind what this sounds like there must be an amazing genius because there's so <laughs> many ins and outs of like what's really going to happen and that's nobody really that i know of is that good that they can do that like even when i play guitar sometimes i'll be playing something and my hand will hit the wrong note or i'll play the c shape but not down on the first fight, I'll play it up and I'll hear it. And I'll say, wait, hey, actually, that sounds really good. <laughs> I have to remember that for later. Then you get expertise with, with the, by making mistakes and hearing what you did. Same thing happens in playgrounds. You can, you can try this frequency. You can right. try this uh, level of feedback. You can try all these parameters, kind of like tweaking a, your pedal board. But you're gaining experience in the language, in the process of turning code into sound in a, in a way that's very quick, you know, because you can't write all this code and then wait five minutes for something to compile. You listen to it and go back writing code. That's the way they used to have to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, but now you don't have to. And I think that could lend itself to ha having a lot of people be much more adept at writing sounds with code. <laughs> Right. And what's interesting is it, it kind of fulfills a role that previously it was just the graphic toolboxes like Max or PD that provided the opportunity to sort of like program and hear the results without going through this whole compilation run, quit, relaunch the editor kind of round round trip. That seems really that seems like a really neat neat way to work. So Matthew, since you've actually been involved in making some like tools that are available on uh, on the App Store, what is the different? What is the process that you went through in terms of like learning the syntax and learning to use these tools and maybe playing in the playground to making a complete application? What what did that trail look like for you? Well, uh, in regards to Synth One. It started out as just a really simple synthesizer example. At the time, there wasn't any kind of open source synthesizer written in Swift. So Ari and I decided to make one, and it ended up being called Analog Synth X. And I think we meant it just to be a, a code example, so we put it on the App Store, and we only expected like five or six people to download it in case they download the code to go <laughs> along with it. And I think Centopia found it, and then it got like six or 7,000 downloads in one day, and we were just like, wow. I mean, it was good and bad. Like, it was bad because we weren't expecting actual end users to use it. It was mainly for developers. <laughs> okay. And so it, it had a lot of bugs. So it was just like just a ton of one-star reviews. <laughs> uh, but on the flip side, we thought maybe there's an audience of people who want a cool, free synthesizer. And so from there, we decided, you know, we would build it on. And, you know, and as you know, like 
someone who's involved in modular sense, you can't just you know build one feature. You got to keep adding more and more yes. <laughs> and more. <laughs> and then two years later, it's finally ready for the App Store with slightly better reviews this time. Well, and also, uh, did synth synth one came first, and then the FM player came along after that? Uh, so FM player was just kind of a, a side thing I made in the interim just to show how we could uh, how people could convert contact or EXS instruments to play an audio kit. So we also uh, have that source code available right. for people to play around with. Got it. Again, getting back to this idea, how much time do you ex like spend experimenting and how difficult is it to take your experiments, whether it's in the playgrounds or whatever, and make the application that shows up in the store? I mean, how much, how difficult is that like translation process? You know, it's pretty difficult, and luckily Ari uh, helps with a lot of the heavy heavy lifting. It's very much uh, a community effort sometimes. Mm -hmm. Right. What audio kit, using audio kit allows you to do is get the audio part done, and then you have to worry about all the other stuff that makes an app worth getting on mm -hmm. the App Store. The problem is not always just does the audio sound great. It's does it feel good does it the does the uh do the graphics look nice is it snappy do the presets sound great there's so much polish that goes to making an app correct that's actually going to be a hit on the app store that's you end up affording yourself the time to work on that rather than working on the audio as much because sure. audio can, should make that easier Ari, i i noticed that this is actually this actually supports iOS, macOS, and even the tvOS. Is there are there massive differences between the three operating system variants? And do you see, in general, people focusing on iOS more than the others, or is it is it fairly broad use across all all variants? Uh, it's widely varied across all three. I don't know a single tvOS app. <laughs> that oh, has okay. been released using AudioKit. It right. it was very easy to create it for us, so we made it available. But I don't know if anyone's done anything with it. iOS and macOS differ in that, you know, you've got a a much more predictable hardware set on iOS devices. You know, you're going to have access to a microphone and mm -hmm. stereo speakers and GPS and all this stuff. So you get this playground where you really know. Uh, what the person has. So there are features that are in iOS uh, that are only available in macOS and some that are only available in iOS, some MIDI things and things like that. Right. But in general, I would say probably about 75% of the work or maybe more has been iOS because it's really where uh, you have a chance to make something that's going to take off. Uh, Mac apps, maybe Mac apps will become cool again but as far as like people trying to make a make something quick that's interesting ios has been a, a more interesting platform recently right. that being said i love mac os i think serious musicians still use it and we uh endeavor to have more things that are audio kit based appear on mac os for instance and one in the future other projects that we're working on Sure. Now, in in terms of support for the Swift language, is that Apple only, or or is that kind of a open enough language definition that we're going to see Windows and Linux all variants of the Swift language as well? Well, the truth about that is that it's not just the Swift language that we rely on, or or the Objective C language. It is the library yeah. the, of, of software that makes the SDK right. Sure. So. Where you could write the Swift portion of, uh, you could write audio kit interface building on in Swift and run it on Linux, all the audio unit stuff has not been ported to Linux, right. so nothing would work. Yeah. Uh, so it is, it, we rely on a lot of the core audio things that appear only on these Mac, uh, these Apple devices. So it's not so much a question of the language, it's more of the supporting materials. If they made a Linux uh, version of core audio, then of course <laughs> we would totally be down for that. And, right. uh, or if we wrote our internals to instead of using audio units at that level, we were using whatever is available on Android or Linux, 
Um, that's a lot of work that I don't consider myself the right person to take on. But if somebody sure. were in the world, like really uh, digging the audio kit community, but would love to have things work on Android and, and want to put that time in, the we have a mantra on our GitHub about all the things that makes audio kit audio kit. And it has nothing to do with Apple. It has to do with the style of the language that we are a high level language where we describe connections. We have our parameters spelled out. Things can be read linearly. It's not graphical. You know, like those are the things that, that make audio kit audio kit. The Apple devices is just where we are right now. I think eventually that might change. Again, since you have a you you focus a little more on making making devices. First of all, do you do work on Mac OS too, or uh, all the stuff we talked about was real iOS focused? Do you do Mac OS stuff as well? Not yet. I mean, I'd love to in the future, and it looks like Apple's going to make some tools available next year so that you can write interfaces for both mm -hmm. with uh, a little less effort. For right now, you have to write two different interfaces for apps if you want it to run on Mac OS, okay. and that's kind of a pain yeah. unless you use like a cross-platform tool like juice yeah the the problem is using a using a tool like that then uh kind of really hamstrings you from taking advantage of some of this easier to use stuff our time is already up i can't believe it but i'm gonna uh, so i have to ask this before we go much farther what is it that's like burning a hole in your hard drive and you can't wait to release it what are you working on that's like the hot new new I'm I'm really curious. I don't uh, I don't know how to answer that. Um, <laughs> all of our apps that are coming out are getting more and more interesting. We we start off with Audio Kit Synth One, kind of knowing that we were creating a very traditional synthesizer. Mm -hmm. And what I hope to have happen with all of our apps is that we get more and more away from the standard things. That we, the, each one's going to like kind of push the envelope a little further. We had to do something that people understood first uh, so that we, we could make a name for ourselves outside of the toolkit, you know, on the app store. But I'm, what I'm looking forward to with AudioKit is that we, we make musical instruments that are for modern times rather than those that are, that look very familiar and look like you know, the synthesizers of yesteryear. Um, right. So, the new new for me will be any audio kit apps that that feel like they were specifically designed to be on the device they're on and take advantage of that rather than make excuses for that. <laughs> sure, sure. So you're not a big fan of the wood grain side panels, you're saying? Um, I mean, we can go on for another 45 minutes on that. <laughs> I... <laughs> I think it's really remarkable how uh, when Apple turned its back on skeuomorphism, the only division that could not uh, do that, basically, I don't know if they just did not have the, the innovation to do that or were afraid to do that, was the audio stuff. GarageBand stayed extremely skeuomorphic. Right. And you could say that yeah, a lot of the things in there are need to be skeuomorphic, otherwise you wouldn't know how to use them. And I, I would say that must have been the reason, but I am not a fan of that. I want to see things moving forward. Even audio in general, we, we're doing a lot of our terminology. We are emulating things that were invented and created like 50 years ago. And music has been around for longer than anything. So I feel like as we get better at describing what audio should be and what music is like on, in a computer environment, we're actually going to get terminology that goes back further in time, uh, saying we're not going to be talking about oscillators necessarily, but we should be talking about pitch and new ways to describe timbre that aren't derivatives of the electronic world, but more higher level than that even. Right. So to me, that would be a, a really exciting thing to see. I'm on, on board with Ari, and I, I just want to say that I'm also working on more in the AI realm of, you know, kind of pushing that beyond the cheesy things that we've kind of seen so far, mm. uh, you know, as, as more of a, a music creation tool and not so much a replacement for creativity, but more of a supplement, if that makes sense. Sure. So before I, before I hang up one last question, 
And I get to ask you this. This is one that I don't get to ask people very often because not very many people build tools for making cool stuff. Of all the things that you've seen come out of the audio kit community, let's start with you, Matthew. What is the thing that maybe has surprised you the most? What surprises, and I, I would say even delights me, is when I see people who add audio kit to their app and then it becomes a huge success instead of just you know, rolling with that, they come back and become contributors. For example, there was an app called Black Box, which was, uh, you know, I think it reached number one in games, and the developer won an Apple Design Award, and he implemented AudioKit to make these audio games in it, and even though he was making a living from it, and he was one of the most successful game developers around, he came back and added code after code to AudioKit, just like obscure things that you can do when you have you know four million users in your game you discover all these problems with audio <laughs> right and, and he came back and fixed that for people for the next generation of audio programmers so they wouldn't have to do that and i just just kind of blown away when you have a community where instead of taking people making an effort to come and, and give back and i think that's what makes audio kit so unique and so special is that kind of mentality sure and Ari, how about you? What have what have you seen that has surprised you the most? I, you know, it's funny because I feel that anytime I see any app created with Audio Kit, I'm so delighted by it, like, <laughs> and I'm surprised that anyone's doing anything. You know, for me, Audio Kit was uh, one of the reasons I I love this being on this podcast today is because when I listen to other people in your interviews, every almost to a man, they are passionate and convinced that they have the answer to music like their <laughs> their their take on it like from keith mcmillan and uh i'm forgetting some of the names but they they have a certain take on things and they love it and they think this has got to be the, the best way for everyone i am no different <laughs> i feel like audio kit is is a really good tool and really uh really useful for me but anytime i see someone who actually resonates with me and like says yeah this was really great i feel that that was amazing so it's not like there's any been one thing in particular just anytime anyone comes out with anything i'm just super happy and uh it kind of validates that that the insanity i was talking about where sure. everyone feels like their way is the right way well every time somebody comes up with an app i'm like Hey, maybe I'm not so crazy. <laughs> <laughs> well said, well said. Yeah, very good. All right, uh, guys, thank you so much for the time. Uh, this has been a fascinating talk. I mean, it, I think I'm going to rush over to the Barnes & Noble and get that uh, Swift book that I keep on holding but I never have bought yet. Uh, that, that one's maybe coming home with me. But I want to thank you so much for the time and for filling me in a little bit on, on the background of this, but also filling me in a little bit about you and, uh, and, and uh, your artistry as well. So thank you so much for that. Thank you so much. It's been an honor, and thanks, everyone, for listening. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. All right. And with that, we'll say goodbye. Have a good one. Bye. Bye. All right, there you have it. Kiss and all. <laughs> uh, nothing like revealing a love for the band Kiss to sort of like make you wonder what your demographics are going to look like next week. Uh, I want to very much thank uh, Matthew and Ari for hanging out and talking smart, but also helping me learn a little bit more about what the world of Swift programming is like, as well as what Audio Kit does. Uh, it sounds really exciting, and I really do, in fact, want to get into it. I want to be that Apple TV guy. I want to be the the audio pro on Apple TV. I'm sure there's a future in that. Nevertheless, uh, thank you so much for listening. Remember to check out uh, the stuff going on over at Splice.com. Again, if you want to take a peek at it, please use our special link, which is Splice.com slash artmusictech-music. And I will talk to you all next week. Thanks. Bye.